Let's talk about some geography. We use maps as our main tool, like a hammer or a screwdriver. It's a tool that we use to understand different places and why these different places on the map are different. So let's start the timer. Uh, come on, phone, you need to unlock. All right, timer is rolling. Just a quick definition of geography. According to Google, the study of physical features of the earth and its atmosphere and the human activity as it affects and is affected by these, including the distribution of populations, meaning why a bunch of people live in one place and don't live in another place. And we can look at a map and we can see the difference. And then we can come up with reasons why they're in different places, different resources. Hey, there's oil here. There's water here. There's coal here. There's beautiful forests here. There's a desert there. Land use and industries, why there are big factories in some places and in some places there's nothing and there's no money and people are struggling. And we can look at a map and we can see the differences and we can come up with ideas and theories about why those differences exist. So going back to that definition, physical features and human interaction, and that's really what we're talking about here with geography. Physical geography and human geography. Let's talk about physical geography first. And we're mainly talking about natural geography, the nature, the things when you think of the land, the air, the water, those things that you see. So kind of, it wouldn't matter. If there weren't humans on the earth, we could still study this. And we can study and it did exist because humans haven't been here forever. So if you really want to understand physical geography, just think of there's no humans. So just think of the earth, the forest, the nature, land and water, mountains, rivers, seas, deserts, oceans, Antarctica, ice caps, underwater to the sea, deep, deep in the sea. We're thinking of nature. We can think of animals. We can think of how they interact, dinosaurs. All those things are physical geography. You can see on the map here in America, the differences in, so you have mountains out west, we have two oceans, we have the Gulf of Mexico, we have lakes, we have the plains, we have a desert, we have uh, a coastal plain, we have all kinds of different uh, land formations according to the physical geography. We're also going to study the weather and we can study the climate. Again, separate from human geography. There's human geography over here and then there's physical geography. So we're talking about really regardless of humans, this is what's happened on the earth for billions of years. We can look at climate, which would be in some places it's cold. If you go north and further away from the equator, where you're further away from the sun, it gets colder. Brr. And as you get closer to the equator or closer to the sun, we find warmer temperatures and in warm environments, different plants grow, different animals live, different insects live. One of the worst things about moving to the south is you find out how many different bugs there are on the earth. As you move north, there aren't as many insects, there aren't as many bugs, there aren't as many nasty, ugly animals that are wanting to kill you. That's physical geography, things that really aren't connected to humans. Also weather patterns, tornadoes in some places, hurricanes in some places. That's physical geography, the natural, the nature, not really connected to humans. Human geography is a different story. This is where we look at the land and how people affect it or the relationship between people and the land. This is human geography. This is often a little more interesting and it does combine the land and water. I mean, you can take physical geography and then connect it to human geography in, in terms of how do we use water? Why do we live in some places where we can farm in some places? Why don't we live in mountains? Why do some people live in the desert? So you can find a combination between the two where the humans interact with the physical. And when we talk about that, then that's going to be human geography. If we're talking about how humans interact with the land, then that's human. Although it connects to the physical, if we're bringing the humans in, this is going to be technically human geography. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't have to get really uh, locked into the different categories. Not a big deal. You don't have to worry about that as much. Just understand that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the land and sometimes we're looking at how humans interact with the land. Culture, this is one of the more fun things. So again, we're using maps as a tool to understand differences and then make guesses to why those differences are. What you see here on the map are the generic names for soft drinks. And this is a map of America. And you can see in this blue area where I'm from, we call soft drinks pop. If you live in the South, you, in this area of the South, you call soft drinks everything. You can drink a Mountain Dew and a lot of people call it a Coke. You can drink a Pepsi, people call it a Coke. Everyone calls it a Coke. These are cultural differences, differences in language that happen in different reasons. So we're using a map to understand some differences. It's kind of a silly difference. I found it here on the East Coast. Everyone says soda. 
So just to show the differences, we're using a map as a tool to understand the differences of people. And then we could try to figure out, well, why is that? What happened that created this? This would require more investigation and we would have to go above and beyond maps. But maps are a good starter. They also help us sort information and easily understand differences. Like right here, I can easily understand there is a difference now, it might just be in soft drinks, but there might be other differences between people that live in this area of America and this area of America. We can go a step further by looking at culture. We can look at religion, and we'll find out that many of the people in the South are Baptists. Many people in these blue areas are Catholics. And then we have a spread of Methodists. And then up here, we have Lutherans. And so we use, again, a tool to understand the differences in people, cultural differences. This is human differences, and we use the map to understand how we're separated. And then you would go a step further and research the history and find out, well, why is that? And we'll probably find something to do with migration patterns or phenomenons throughout history that led to the spread of these religions but you would have to dig deeper. The map's not always gonna give you the answers. A lot of times it's gonna give us the clues and lead us along the path, but a lot of times maps will only go so far. You have to read the books, you have to do the history, you have to do interviews, you have to research and talk to people and watch videos, go through the primary sources, read the textbook to get the absolute bottom of the answer. But the map is a very simple, easy way to understand differences and to also relay information. Here we have, Ancestry with largest population. So again, we can see that many, we have Germans who live mainly through this light blue area. We have uh, the purple would be African Americans. And you could probably take a guess, hmm, why are African Americans the dominant population throughout this part of the country? We have a map here, a tool that helps us understand the differences. And we can see that. Then you start going a step further. Now, some of the people watching this video maybe are able to understand the difference or know why black or African Americans make up the major, the majority of the population throughout these southern states. If you didn't know, you could go through a textbook and find out the main idea here. And now this is a hypothesis, pretty much true. It's that it would be connected to slavery. African Americans or Africans were brought into this region and were slaves, and so it's not that a surprise today that this region of America, where slavery existed, is still majority Black American or African American. Germans throughout here. Uh, this area just defines itself as American. If you notice over here, you're going to notice that these are Mexican Americans are the majority. That would make sense because this area of America is on the border of Mexico. So the map is the tool to help us understand the differences and to lead us down the road. It's also a great tool to help us communicate. And you quickly can look at this map and see this information without ever seeing this video, without having really dove into social studies. You don't have a master's degree in American history, but you can see this map and make sense of the world or make sense of America. Gun ownership. You're going to see that, oh, for whatever reason, in this part of the country, a lot of people own guns. They own guns here. They don't own guns here. They don't own guns here. Why is that? Why does Ohio own few guns? So what we can use this map is it's a starting point. We can understand the differences. It, and then you start asking questions. You interview people, you visit the state, you look at the laws, you look at the history. Is there something that happened in the history of Ohio or, or New York that have led these states to be not big gun ownership states? Or is it their governments that have passed laws in these specific states that have banned guns? What is it? Is there a cultural history? Is there events that happen throughout time? Is it just simply their governments passed laws? Is it these areas are, you need more weapons to protect yourself? Is it because it's more of the wilderness and there's bears and there's wolves and it makes more sense to own a weapon? Or is it because there just isn't very many people out here? Economics. So when we study economics, we're studying buying, selling goods. We're, we're, we're studying people's actions. We're, we're studying scarcity. We're, we're studying resources and what people do with their resources. And here we can look at a map of the world and see, well, who sells what? In these parts of the, the country, people mine and sell oil. These guys sell gold. These guys make all of our electronics, which makes sense. Where does all of your TVs and video game systems come from? They come from China. Uh, motor vehicles. You ever heard of a Honda? Have you ever heard of a Toyota? They come from Japan, although we make them in the country, but their main export is Japan. The Japanese have created those. So we can look at the map and see different places in the world make different things. Why is that? Well, this is pretty obvious. Why does Saudi Arabia sell oil? Because there's oil underneath their soil. Well, why don't, why doesn't Canada sell a bunch of, actually they do, they're starting to sell a lot of oil. A better example, why doesn't Mexico sell oil? Because they don't have any oil. 
These guys have oil down here. Colombia and uh, Venezuela have oil, but not in these countries. So what you have, so we can see the map and we can start to understand the terrain and we also can understand what people are doing with the land, how they're interacting with the land to make money, what goods are selling. And this map would change over time. This is what we sell today. But if you go back in time 200 years ago, we sold different things. How much time we got? Oh, we're doing right. Environmental. Now, this is kind of confusing. Like, oh, well, you said environment is physical. It is physical. But how we interact with the environment, that is going to be human. Again, environment alone, weather, climate, animals, plants, nature, mountains, valleys, deserts, that is physical. But if we're talking about humans interacting with the physical, then we're going to lean that towards human geography. So how we interact with the environment. Uh, you see here, this is slash and burn uh, agriculture, where you chop down all the trees, you set it on fire. Not good for the earth. We don't do this anymore. Some places still do this. And when you burn this, it puts nitrates into the soil, and then you can farm. It's a really easy, quick way to start a farm, but it's really, really bad for the earth. But you know what? This is what we do, where we just, we chop down all the trees, we level the land out, and we build these giant buildings and roads. That's not natural either, is it? But that's how we interact. We say, look, if we build these towns and houses, we'll have shelter, we can build economies, we can make goods, we can sell goods, and we can lift up everybody's life, right? When we have stores and jobs and opportunities, everyone can make money, and everyone has shelter, everyone can live better than if we didn't. If we didn't have this, you're out living in the cold, you're, it's raining, and you're hitting, sitting under a tree, maybe you've got a tent, maybe you're making a tree out of straw or a house out of straw. This is what we're studying is how do we interact with the lands? What do we do to the land? Do we build a farm here? Do we build corn here? Do we build small time farming to a big giant farms? Do we do nothing but corn? Do we do corn and soy? And how do we interact? Do we build cities? Where do we build the cities? What places do we skip over? Do we leave some places unprotected? Do we have cows? Do we have a bunch of cows? It's how the humans interact with the environment, what things we do. Do we build on top of the beach, do we not build on top of the beach? Uh, health and disease, we can also just look at, again, this might not tell us the answers, but it helps us understand what's going on. We can quickly see here in Africa, in Southern Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that AIDS is uh, beyond epidemic proportions here throughout this area, but not here. That's very interesting. A lot of times, oh, well, there's an AIDS problem in Africa. Well, there is an AIDS par problem in part of Africa, but not in other parts. And we can use this information to understand, well, what makes these different parts different? Why is this, why is AIDS not necessarily a problem in North Africa, but as we get to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa, then AIDS is a problem. What are the differences? The map's not going to necessarily tell us that. It may give us some physical geography clues that lead us along the path and maybe, but typically the, the map is a starting point, but it's also an easy way to communicate this information to you. We can see the exist in America. We can see that, okay, why in these states is AIDS prevalent? And in these other states, they don't have an issue with AIDS. There's, AIDS is very rare. What are the differences? What are they doing that they're not doing? And if the government wanted to, if the government was able to find a, the reason why this was happening, the government then would decide, okay, we need to target these people to stop the, the uh, spread of AIDS. Well, you wouldn't target Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming and North Dakota and South Dakota. You wouldn't go, you wouldn't spend millions and millions of dollars on commercials and spend a bunch of money in schools to educate students and to tell people they need to practice different behaviors because it's not a problem necessarily here. But you would focus on South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, because there is an issue with AIDS. What do those states have in common? What's going on in those states that we need to change? Again, the map's going to give you some clues and you can look at other maps. There was a map that we looked at earlier in this video that might lead you to believe. You could say, is it religion? Is it race? We don't know, but you can look at more maps to help narrow you down or send you to focus, but you have to do the research. You've got to look in your books. Could it be gun ownership? Could there be a correlation between gun ownership? Well, you'd say that, well, gun ownership was high here. It was low in these other, but it was high here. So does that mean uh, more guns means less AIDS? See, that's the thing. You can't just take two maps and put them together and say, oh, well, this map says Montana has a lot of guns and no AIDS, so there's a correlation there. Uh, you got to do more research. The maps are great tools to communicate information. They are a great starting point, but that is a lot of times where they end. You got to do the homework. You got to do the hard work. You got to read the books. You got to do the primary resources. You got to cross-reference. You got to triangulate. You've got to interview. You got to ask questions. You also have to approach it from, here's what I think. 
and you should approach it as trying to prove yourself wrong. If you have a theory, your research should follow the scientific method of I need to prove myself wrong. I got to try to find everything to prove myself wrong. And if I can't, well, then my theory is probably right. And then you can move forward and then you can use maps to communicate your information. And then a political map. This is just a real simple thing of, look, you can see that the people in these red states probably have different political views than the people in the blue states. But again, just a starting point, just showing us the difference. It's not giving us all the answers. And that's the video for you. Again, the last to close it up again, you have the people in the red states, probably different views from the blues people. Why is that? It helps the starting point of why. Let's do the investigation. But it also helps us. I can easily and quickly communicate this to you by showing you blue states, red states. They're different. Why? Well, we've got to do more research. Thank you.